Anger and jealousy would lead to a brutal homicide. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Annette Burnside. Viewer discretion is advised. Annette Marie Schopencher, she was born on July 22nd, 1963, and she was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. When Annette was 16, the family would end up moving uh, to Florida, specifically to the Manatee County area. Annette was always described as kind of like a very shy, almost bashful person. Socializing wasn't the easiest thing for her to do. And so when the family moved to Florida, she was still in high school, and she just had issues, uh, you know, interacting and with fellow classmates and making a group of friends there. It wasn't easy for her. And from what it sounds like, when she was 16 or 17 years old, she ends up dropping out of high school and gets a job as a cashier at a local grocery store. After working there for a short amount of time, she ends up befriending... I guess a man who works behind the deli counter. His name was Jim Burnside. Jim was 28 years older than Annette. And one day, uh, Jim approached her and asked her out on a date. And she said yes. Her parents were not happy about this. They did not like Jim. They would obviously have hoped that she would have found someone in her age bracket, but she apparently fell in love with Jim pretty quickly. Annette's mom, after meeting Jim, she said that she just always felt so uncomfortable around him. Her mom and dad both were like, we just get bad vibes from this guy. I mean, first of all, he's 28 years older. It's just, they, there was just a lot of things, a lot of red flags they noticed with him, but they were at times kind of afraid to say anything to Annette because they didn't want to, you know, anger her. Obviously this is, different times. This was in the very early 80s when all of this started. By 1981, Annette is 18 years old and Jim proposes to her and they get married. Jim was 46 years old when he married 18 year old Annette. And from the moment they got married, Annette's life was a living hell. The domestic abuse started pretty much from day one. It was extreme verbal abuse, but it was also physical abuse. The violence in the home just began to escalate and escalate and escalate. She didn't tell anyone because, well, she was afraid of, of Jim. What would he do to me if I told anyone? So she had to play off like so many, unfortunately, so many women have to do in these situations that everything is fine, everything is hunky-dory, there's nothing wrong here. Um, just to appease him and for him to not get more violent towards her or worse, kill her. So she became trapped. Like again, unfortunately, a lot of women have become trapped in this exact same scenario. They fear for their lives and that's why they don't leave. Jim was insanely jealous of her. Uh, she was not allowed to do anything or go anywhere, especially without his approval first. Then he would drink a lot. He was an alcoholic and when he got drunk, he would beat her. And he one time told her, if you ever, ever try to leave me, I will kill you. Right around the time their first uh, anniversary was coming up, Annette would end up going to a, a battered women's shelter and she basically checked herself into it. She called Jim from the shelter and said, this is it, I'm done, I'm leaving you. And he says on the phone to her, if you do that, I will find you and I will kill you, but also I will kill your family. And so she felt afraid for her family. And so she, she goes back. She didn't want her family to suffer because of her. And that alone is just, just that's just beyond uh, tragic and, and horrible. And then for the next couple of years, they remain a couple. And they, again, he continues to be abusive towards her. But they also end up having two children, two daughters. Their daughter's name were Stacy and Tara. And there was a small chunk of time after the kids were born that things seemed to be changing. Things seemed to be turning more positive. Jim wasn't, you know, as abusive to her. Annette uh, got to a point where she wanted to have a job because Jim wouldn't allow her to have a job since they got married. But he had lost his job and so he actually allowed her to go get work as a receptionist at a car dealership. Which kind of surprised a lot of people because of how jealous he was of how he didn't like 
her being around any men whatsoever, that was surprising to many people. Once she got a job there though, she was happy. She was so excited and she excelled very quickly there. She was doing great, but Jim still controlled her because he was the one to have to drop her off to work and pick her up from work. She wasn't allowed to do that on her own. She became friends with a coworker who only has identified himself as Dave. I'm not sure if that's actually his real name or not, but he was a, a a car dealer there, and she asked him an advice about purchasing her own car. Essentially, she ended up getting her own car. Within a few days of her getting it, Jim destroyed it. Uh, Jim would go out, he went outside with several tools, and he began bashing in the headlights, he broke the taillights, he was ripping things out of the engine. He just annihilated that car. And he goes running back into the house, because he was pissed that she bought a car, meaning she would have her own freedom to go whenever she wants, wherever she pleases, and he didn't like that. And at the time, one of their daughters was five years old, and Annette and the daughter were in the living room playing when all this happened. He comes storming back into the house, and he threatens to kill Annette, and she's obviously terrified, and his little da daughter, his five-year-old daughter, looks up and says, Daddy, you wouldn't kill me, would you? He looks her right in the face and says, yes, I would. I would absolutely kill you. And so that was the final straw. The following day, um, she gets in touch with police while Jim was out of the house. And she asks police to escort her um, around the house to get her belongings and her kids' belongings and, and take her to, I guess, the airport because of the domestic abuse. And they were very willing to help her. So she gets in, she cops drop her off the airport. She flies the kids while Jim is still out. She literally flies the kids to a different state to be with family. And then within five days, she has to fly back to Florida because she has to continue working at her job. And for a, for a little while, Jim thought she had, she had just picked up and left him and didn't know where she was. But then he found out she was back in town and back at the car dealership. And so according to numerous witnesses, uh, Jim was stalking her at the car dealership. He would sit outside with binoculars and watching her as she interacted with everyone. And they tried to go to the police and say, listen, he's stalking you know me, he's stalking Annette. Police couldn't do anything because because basically, essentially what they said was is that he needed to actually do something in order for them to do something. Basically meaning she has to be physically harmed or worse before we can step in, <laughs> which is insane. On February 17th, 1988, all of this would come to an end. Annette was three days away from having to attend a court hearing for the divorce proceedings. Jim had stalked her at the car dealership. She, he saw her go and meet this Dave co-worker of hers for lunch, and she gets into the car with Dave, and all of a sudden, a van pulls up behind them, and it's Jim. Jim gets out, armed with a rifle, and he breaks the window on the passenger seat where Annette is sitting. Dave gets out of the car and starts to confront Jim, basically trying to defend Annette. Jim lifts the rifle, points it directly at Dave, and shoots him. He was shot in his abdomen. Annette gets out of the car. She begins to scream. She tries to run. She gets, I don't know, 50, 60 feet away before Jim uh, catches up to her, knocks her to the ground, takes a knife, and stabs her numerous times until she is dead. And then Jim runs, he takes off. Witnesses who observed this basically tried to get there as fast as they could to help, but it was already too late. The coroner would determine that Annette suffered 15 stab wounds. The majority of them were inflicted upon her after she was already deceased. Dave, by some miracle, was still conscious. He was still actually alive. He was rushed to the hospital and they actually, they managed to save him and he recovered. And so he was able to give a very detailed statement to police about what happened and who did this. All of this happened in broad daylight, right in front of people. And Jim escaped in broad daylight in front of people. And from that point moving forward, Jim Burnside was a wanted fugitive. He was going to be charged with the murder of his wife, Annette. About three years later or so, at Annette's gravesite, a groundskeeper who was doing some work nearby noticed a man in a baseball cap, kind of almost appeared like he was trying to hide himself, was at Annette's grave. And then the groundskeeper approached him and the man at the grave ran away. And the groundskeeper would later identify that man as Jim Burnside, based on a photo lineup. On October 23rd, 1991, this case actually airs on Unsolved Mysteries, and then later it appears on America's Most Wanted. 
after one of the airings on Unsolved Mysteries, a couple in Shelby County, Alabama, calls the authorities to report that they think they know where Jim Burnside is. They know him as a man named Al Wilson. He was working as a carpenter there in that area. And I, I guess he was working at a flea market. And so the FBI contacts the local police there and says, we think he's going to be there at this flea market. We need you to go there and apprehend him. It was October 24th, 1991. The FBI does get to the flea market and they do spot Jim Burnside. And what happens is basically Jim runs and he pulls out a 357 Magnum and begins firing at the police. The police fire back. He gets into a truck and he's still firing his weapon from the truck. Police are firing back at him. And eventually he stops shooting because he has been shot twice. But he was not, it, they were not fatal wounds. Uh, they were superficial wounds for the most part. And so they were able to apprehend him. They put him in cuffs and they arrested him. According to people in his life at that time, he was, he came off very concerned, very nervous, literally within days of the Unsolved Mysteries episode airing. It is believed by numerous people that he actually saw himself on America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries and knew that the jig was up, that someone was gonna identify him and there was nowhere else he could go. In February of 1992, he was went to trial for the assaulting of police officers with a gunfight, and he got an eight-year prison sentence for that. Then he was extradited back to Florida, where he went on trial for the murder of Annette Burnside. But he wouldn't really go to trial. He would end up pleading no contest to first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. But he would never get out. On November 27th, 2015, Jim Burnside dies in prison. He was 78 years old. And unfortunately, this is just another story. We've heard these stories many times before, and a lot of people, a lot of people never seem to understand, or a lot of people don't, is that it, leaving these types of relationships is not easy. I have sadly covered many cases where the women end up dead because they're afraid of being killed, but they're also afraid of their children being harmed and they're afraid of their families being harmed by this person. So in some cases, they do it because they think they're protecting the other people in their lives, which is commendable. They, you know, unfortunately, they would rather take the beatings than be killed. And it's just, it's not easy. It's a psychological trap that these men put these women in. They have these women under their complete and utter control. And until you're ever in a situation like that, you could probably never truly understand it. But I always see people like commenting like, well, just, why didn't she just leave? Why didn't she leave? Well, she did try to leave a couple of times, but I just, want to reiterate, just leaving isn't easy. It's not easy whatsoever. It may sound easy to you from the outside looking in, but if you're in the situation, just based off what I've heard directly from women, it's not even close to being easy. It's terrifying. They are in their own form of prison. At least in this case, her children were left unharmed. They were raised by Annette's family. And in the end, uh, you know, you wish Annette didn't die. You wish police would have maybe done something before that. But in the end, Annette got the justice she very rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry, Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you are new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories, obviously. Um, so please subscribe to the channel, give the video a like. Also, I tell shorter form true crime stories over on TikTok, uh, so feel free to follow that page if you want to. It is linked below in the link tree in this description of this video. Also in that link tree, you'll find my case list. It's got 6,500 plus names on it. It's mainly primarily alphabetical. Scroll through it, and if you see a name on there, or you don't see a name on there you want me to cover, just email me the name of the case you want me to cover. My email is also listed below. Um, just send me the name of the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add it to the list. I pick these cases I cover each time at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually, I promise. But that is it for this video, and until the next case, ta-ta for now, true crime arunish.